Good evening, friends and colleagues. Welcome to the International Geomorphology Week seminar series. This series is put on by the International Association of Geomorphologists, and it's being the Oceania one, which you're watching now, is a seminars from Australia and New Zealand, and it's hosted by the Australian New Zealand Geomorphology Group. I'd like to acknowledge my co-coordinator, co Nicole Wheeler, and like to thank the IAG for making this series possible. We have six talks for you uh, this evening. It'll be a two hour session. And the first talk is by uh, Katie Jones, talking about um, sediment supply from large earthquakes in New Zealand. The second, Liz Mann talking about submarine offshore channels of southeastern Australia. Next, Dr. Alexandru Cordelian will be talking about a huge radionuclide database for Australia. The fourth talk uh, was to be Dr. Justin Stout, but he's out in New Zealand looking at the damage done by a recent cyclone there. And instead of that talk, uh, he sent some pictures and, and other colleagues in New Zealand as well of the remarkable geomorphic changes that have been produced by recent large cyclones in New Zealand. I think you'll find that very interesting. And uh, Dr. Sam McCall will present that to us. The fifth talk then is uh, sedimentation in um, some uh, shallow um, marine environments in uh, Australia. And the final talk is also from New Zealand, which is Claire Wilkinson. He'll be talking about multidisciplinary approaches to landscape geomorphology. So a great range of topics we'll be covering today. I would also just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're on. I'm on Wurundjeri country here in Melbourne, Australia. My name is Ian Rutherford. I'm with the University of Melbourne and Alluvium Consulting and uh, will be your uh, host for this evening. And now we'll go to our first talk, which is Katie Jones. Thank you. on those volumes now. That, that uncertainty is spatially variable. So this is what um, the M32 significant change looked like for the entire catchment between 2016 and 2017. We can see there's quite significant negative change on the hill slopes and we can see the response from the rivers with the grading. And we see there's kind of this coupling between erosion on the upper hill slopes and deposition on the lower hill slopes and in the fluvial channel. And we can see the kind of main riverbed in the um, Hapuku River is starting to grade, and it's really dominated by that large rock avalanche. We've got incision of the dam feature itself, and we've kind of got gullying and kind of mass movement within kind of the main, um, the deposit on still on the hill slope within the rock avalanche. Between 2017 and 2019, um, we see kind of a little bit of a different post seismic response. Um, we kind of see that spatially the, the kind of erosion has kind of um, condensed down to kind of a few significant landslides, but again, we're still seeing the response dominated by the Hipoku landslide dam, and you can see that with significant downstream aggradation. But then by the time we get to 2019 to 2021, that epoch, we can see that there's much less kind of change occurring, and we're seeing a lot more of this kind of deposition. Um, and then the riverbed, but we're also seeing some scouring of previously grading sections of the riverbed. And these are just some examples of what this looks like. On the left was the photo of the Hipuku rock avalanche in 2016, and you can see it's completely dammed. There's a large lake behind it. And then this is a photo in 2019, and you can see significant incision into the dam feature, and you can also see a significant channel has been scoured out on the landside deposit, and that goes almost right back up into the um, top of the head scarp. And in total, over those five years, almost 10, kind of just over 9 million um, million cubic metres of sediment was removed from this deposit. So that's pretty significant. And that had pretty significant downstream consequences. So this is looking at um, downstream. And on the left is the ortho mosaic photo from 2016. And again, you can see the, the Hipoku um, rock avalanche is damming the Hipoku River. And we can see the lake. And we can kind of see downstream, the channel's pretty narrow. Um, it's vegetated at the sides. And we've got a kind of pretty narrow active channel. Once we've 
dumped a okay, huge four, four minutes to go thanks four minutes okay thanks. so we can thank you um so we can see kind of there's been significant aggradation down the riverbed you can see it's widened it's aggraded and um, we've got really high connectivity because of this materials making straight into the fluvial system if we compare this to the Kofi catchment, um, we can see the response is a little bit um, more distributed. Again, similar to the Kofi, we kind of have um, spatially variable erosion and deposition, but again, we see this really strong coupling between erosion on hill slopes and deposition directly below the hill slopes. Similar to the Puku catchment, we don't see as much activity from 2017 to 2021. Um, particularly in 2021, we see a lot more um, deposition on hill slopes and we're kind of moving more into diffusive erosion processes. And I'll again just compare this between the riverbed, this is 2016 and 2019. So you can still see it's kind of similar to the Puku catchment where you get a grading and widening of the riverbed as all this material makes it into the fluvial system. So this is just an example of um, the kind of classification scene for how we classified that change. I tried to kind of look at the geomorphic feature upon which the change was occurring, whether that change was negative or positive, indicating erosion or deposition, and then kind of defined the kind of attributed the process that was likely to be driving that change and then kind of linked it to the kind of sediment cascade in terms of whether it was the generation of sediment from hill slopes, whether it was kind of transport of sediment from hill slopes to channels, or whether it was the storage and export of sediment within the fluvial system. And then these are what these post earthquake sediment budgets look like. So this was the hipoku and we can see a huge amount of materials eroded in that first year after the earthquake. Not quite as much material, sorry, even more material is eroded between 2017 and 2019, but not much is eroded between 2019 and 2021. But because we classify kind of what's generating the sediment in terms of the erosion processes and where it's being deposited, we can also kind of do a balance between the volume eroded and the volume deposited, and we can kind of get an estimate for how much sediment is exported beyond the range front. We can see that's pretty significant in the first two epochs, kind of over 2 million um, in the second epoch. In comparison to the Kofi, we have much lower volumes of sediment being remobilized and exported. And we see a similar trend in 2017 to 2019, we had slightly more volume. And then in 2019 to 2021, that sediment budget is pretty skinny, not much is happening in those years. Um, we then take the sediment budget and what we're trying to convert this is into um, from observations and kind of difference models of kind of volumes of change is into a flux rate. So we're looking at the volume of material that was eroded in tonnes per square kilometre per year, and we're comparing that between the three epochs. We've got three rates. We've got a hill slope erosion rate, so how the kind of rate at which material is being remobilised on hill slopes from landside deposits, the hill slope flux rate, the rate at which the sediment was being deposited into the fluvial system, and then the catchment flux, so the rate at which that material was being um, transported out of the range front. And if you can see, there's much higher rates in the hapuku catchment, which is on the left in A, compared to the kofi, which is in B on the right. Um, but we also looked at rainfall patterns to see is this kind of flux in terms of epoch two had much higher rates, did that relate to rainfall and it was a bit hard to tell, we didn't have any significant um, rainfall even though we had a few cyclones, the rainfall wasn't particularly high up in the um, headwaters of the catchment but we did look at kind of rainfall trends, the cumulative deviation from the mean and that was increasing in epoch one and two but not so much in um, epoch three that was declining so maybe there wasn't as much water in the system and therefore less sediment was eroded. I was just going to do a summary um, just before I, my 10 minutes is up. Um, a total of over 10 million cubic metres of sediment was post seismically eroded within the Hapuku catchment, and this is equal to about 26% of the volume of landside debris sitting within the catchment. The majority of this was delivered to the riverbeds, so there was really high connectivity, and about 9% of the total volume was. Um, that was the co-seismic volume was transported beyond the range front of the seaward Kaikoura ranges and that photo to the left is just showing you those seaward Kaikoura ranges and that was that no, that nine percent of the co-seismic landside volume was um, exported from those ranges over five years. In comparison this is the Kofi catchment, this is just the Kofi river at the range front um, pre-earthquake that picture, only about two million cubic meters of sediment was post-seismically eroded, but this is still equal to about 13% of the co-seismic landslide debris volume. So you've kind of got to think of it in context of only about 13 million compared to 30 million for the Hipuku catchment. And the connectivity was slightly lower, about 8% of the, um, the volume of co-seismic debris was delivered to the riverbed and about 5% was exported from the range front of the Seward Kaikoura ranges over that five years. So we kind of, even though the volumes are slightly lower, they do still kind of represent a similar proportion of materials being remobilized and transported. So I just wanted to leave you with some take home points about post-earthquake um, 
processes or what we observed from the Kaikoura earthquake. And these are, I just wanted to stress that these are short-term observations. They're just the first five years after the earthquake. We could have a cyclone Gabriel hit Kaikoura and it might be a much different response. Um, there's also the dominance, what we observed was the dominance of the remobilization of coast seismic landslide deposits rather than new rainfall triggered post seismic landsliding. There were a lot of um, post earthquake landslides triggered by rainfall after the earthquake, but in particular in the Kofi and the Hipoku, it was mainly the remobilization of coast seismic landslide deposits. Um, this erosion is primarily occurring adjacent to the channels, and this may explain why we have this reduction in erosion rates um, between Epoch 2 and 3, is because we have this exhaustion of easily remobilized sediment that's been deposited right next to the channels. And I just want to leave you with, we kind of want to start thinking about um, longer term LIDAR surveys or longer term um, capture of these landscape change, and if we have kind of um, decadal scale surveys, we might start to develop a more holistic understanding of how earthquake induced landsliding relates to the long term erosion rate. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about some um, large incised channels in the Gippsland Basin. So we're going to step it back in geologic time a little bit. Um, this is probably more accurately called paleogeomorphology. Um, but as they say, the, the past is the key to the present and vice versa. So <laughs> um, I'll discuss some modern analogues at the end as well. So this is some work I did as part of my PhD here at Unimel um, with Malcolm Wallace um, with some funding from Geological Society, Society of Australia. So we are on the southeastern corner of the Australian continent uh, in the Gippsland Basin. Um, and the Gippsland Basin has a really long running history of industry interest um, right back to the 1800s till um, right up to today. So the result of that is there's a huge amount of legacy industry data available both onshore and offshore. So we've taken advantage of that for, that, for this study um, and we've used primarily 3D seismic data and some well data throughout the basin um, and in our study area. Um, so this is some, some research from my PhD. Um, the sedimentary fill in the basin can be kind of broadly divided into three groups. So we have the Strzelecki group, the Latrobe group, and then the Sea Spray group. Um, so we are interested in the Latrobe group today. Um, and it's broadly composed of stacked coastal plain and shore face sediments. Um, and they transgress across the basin from off, modern offshore um, to present day onshore. Um, and those um, shore face sediments kind of front an unusually sediment starved marine shelf. So there was very little sedimentation happening in the marine environment during this time. And then we also have these two large incised channels that have kind of cut into these coastal plain sediments. So um, they, so they're called the Tuna and the Marlin Channel. Um, the Tuna Channel incises over 350 metres, and then the Marlin Channel is incised over 550 metres. Um, and historically, the scientists have kind of separated the processes that formed the incision of these channels from the sediment that fills them. Um, so as a result, we have different names for the channel and for the fill. So the Tuna Channel is filled with flounder formation sediments and the Marlin Channel is filled with Tyrum formation sediments. Um, but the kind of big question the scientists have always wondered is what caused that incision? So over 500 metres of, of incisions, pretty significant into the coastal plain. Um, and the kind of consensus thinking has been that the incision must have been driven by tectonic uplift. So the Gippsland Basin has these large anticlines right across the modern day offshore and onshore. Um, and it was believed that that onset of anticline growth must coincide with that channel incision and that the, the um, uplift is driving that incision. However, um, one of the other things I looked at in my PhD was the onset of that timing of that uplift. Um, and we found that it actually happened quite a bit later. Um, so it happened tens of millions of years after this channel incision at the end of the Eocene. So if that uplift event isn't driving the channel incision, um, we kind of have to have an answer for what, what's forming, what's causing them, what's driving that process. 
Uh, and as part of my PhD work, I interpreted all of those coastal plain as shore face sediments. So they are stacked units. That's kind of what we're looking at here, those colored um, units. And one consistent thing that appeared throughout all of those shore face units um, was the presence of broad um, strand planes or beach ridge planes. So on all of the seismic data, when we look at a horizontal horizon, we have these lovely linear strand lines. Um, and that's just indicating a really high level of wave reworking at the beach happening at that time. But it's allowed us to kind of constrain the paleo shorelines at any given point in time throughout those sediments from the Cretaceous right up to the present day. Um, so now we're going to look at some, some 3D seismic data through these channels. Um, so we have, you'll see here we have the Marlin and then we have the Tuna Channel. I actually ended up dividing the Tuna Channel into two. Um, because when I started to interpret it, I realized there was a, a fairly distinct and consistent cross-cutting relationship within the tuna channel. Um, and the channel fill, in fact, was two different ages. So I've kind of divided up the tuna into two. Um, if we look at the base surface of these channels, um, so I've merged the, the base of all three channels. Um, and we made this surface. So this is basically a dip angle map. So the darker the color, the higher the dip. So it's basically showing the nice, really steeply dipping channel walls of these incised channels. And this is this kind of allowed us to um, interpret the maximum erosive extent of these channels. And we were also able to see things like um, terracing and slumps and tributaries um, within that basal channel morphology. So if we look at some data through these channels, um, starting with the oldest, the Tuna Channel 1, um, it's filled with the flounder formation sediments. Um, we see on the seismic, it has these really nice erosive kind of channel walls that have cut into those underlying sediments. And we also see that they've got, uh, the seismic is kind of a low amplitude fill, which is common for um, some channel formation sediments. If we move to the next tuna channel, um, slightly younger. Um, we, we have actually managed to retain or preserve the head of this channel. So you can see it's got a nice broad erosive um, character. You can see the base of the channel shows up quite nicely on the seismic data. And again, we have that low amplitude kind of channel fill. Um, if we step down a little bit in still within tuna channel two, and we start to see things like these dipping reflectors, which are indicating, possibly indicating multiple phases of channel cut and fill. So we've got some kind of lateral migration um, and more than one event within this channel, within its morphology and its evolution. And we have wells through both of these tuna channels. Um, and when we look at the well response, this is the gamma ray, um, we see that the, the sediments primarily composed of fine grained material. So on these logs, the yellow is sand, the brown is silt and mud. Um, so it's generally quite a silty muddy fill, but with some um, beds of quite sandy material. And the industry reports for these wells reported things like dinoflagellates, agglutinate foraminifera, planktonic foraminifera, um, glauconitic siltstone, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, and we also had some core. So this is core through one of the wells in Tuna Channel 2. And kind of as you'd expect, there's a variety of lithologies, a lot of fine grain mudstones, but also some quite coarse sandstones. Um, and we see things like biturbation, um, little trace fossils, and some hints of ripples. So now we're shifting to the youngest channel, and that's the Marlin. Um, so this, this channel's our um, probably most beautifully preserved of the three. Um, so if we start at the head, we've also preserved the head of this channel. And you can see it's got, again, that really broad erosive kind of character. The one really interesting thing about the Marlin channel is that it has a really distinctly underfilled character. So where the tuna channel was filled with flounder sediments up to the brim, the Marlin channel is um, significantly underfilled. So this is our channel that's over 500 meters of incision, but we've got charum formation sediments only in the base or quarter maybe. And then the rest of the 
um, channel has been infilled with passive drapes of the overlying sea spray, sea spray group, um, which in this location is deep marine carbonates. So we've stepped down the Marlin um, channel a little and we uh, are looking at one of those across one of those nice tight little meanders um, and we can see that lovely kind of entrenched morphology at the base of that channel. Um, and again, those classic erosive walls of the channel and the low amplitude channel fill. Um, so we have over 81 kilometers of this channel preserved in the data. Um, it actually goes off the seismic, off the edge of the seismic data. So it was, it was obviously a lot longer. This is a nice big one. And we have a few wells through this um, extent as well. So again, and um, we see kind of a variety of lithologies, quite a bit of fine grain material, but also some quite sandy beds. Uh, and the industry reports um, indicate things like a large abundance and diversity of dinoflagellates, echinoderm spines, brachiopods. Um, and that's essentially what we saw when we looked at the core as well. This really classic green color of glauconite, the marine sediment, and all of these brachiopod fossils. So we needed to try and put that information of those big incised channels into the stratigraphic context. Where does this fit in rela relation to these shore face and coastal plain deposits? So we have um, the ages of the channel fill. Um, we have the ages of the sediments that have been incised into. So we have that from industry data, from biostratigraphic data. And we also have the paleo shoreline locations. So we can start kind of trying to relate all of that information. And when we plotted the um, incised channels, um, what was left of them, what's preserved, relative to the coeval paleo shorelines that were forming at the same time, um, we found that they sat almost consistently seaward of the paleo shorelines, either seaward or right at those paleo shorelines. Um, so kind of with looking at all of that information, we think that that's a, a pretty good evidence that these are um, not fluvial, um, that are in fact submarine canyons a prehistoric submarine canyon system. Um, so these are shelf incising submarine canyons. So this is a flooded marine shelf. Um, and they've actually, they sit in quite close proximity to those paleo shorelines. Um, and so with those paleo shorelines kind of backstepping and transgressing, these submarine canyons have eroded by headward erosion um, as well as downstream erosion. And uh, we went and looked at the, the literature. We looked for some modern analogs. I mean, found there's there's quite a few. Um, just a, these are just a couple. There's the Delgada Canyon, um, which is forming its heads only 100 meters from shore in as little as nine meters of water. Um, there's a whole series of canyons in Spain, but probably the nicest um, analog we found was the Monterey Canyon um, in California. So this is the the Monterey Canyon on the right the, of the bathymetry, um, and then next to it we have the Marlin Canyon, and you'll see that they're virtually the same scale. Um, and very similar in character. We have the same kind of broad um, head of the canyon with tributaries, we have terraces, we have slump scars, we have meanders. Um, they're very consistent in morphology and appearance. Uh, so kind of putting that all together, um, we have this really large depth of incision and we have likely multiple incision and infilling events. So if these were fluvial, um, you would expect there to be a pretty significant regional unconformity associated with over um, 500 metres of incision. Uh, three um, minutes, please. No worries. Um, uh, we don't need that with submarine canyons. You know, they don't need a big regional uplift event in order to, in order to incise. Um, also, this canyon incision predates compressional tectonics. So we kind of don't need the tectonics at all to occur at the same time. The channel fill is consistently marine. Um, and if these are submarine canyons, then you don't really need to invoke a different process for the fill as opposed to the incision. And we think that the that really um, sediment starved marine shelf, um, that's as a result of all of that marine sediment being funneled into these submarine canyons. So it's not being deposited on the shelf at the time, probably via kind of longshore processes literal in the littoral zone. Um, all of that sediment's kind of being funneled into the, the canyons and then far offshore outside our data area. Um, and then obviously then the channels, the canyons being located seaward of the paleo shorelines um, is pretty good evidence. And we think this is essentially like an older version of the Bass Basin that we see to uh, the Bass, sorry, Bass Canyon that we see today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, some carcinogenic isotope data. And before I do that, I want to give you a little bit of introduction into cosmogenic nuclide analysis, a very, very short one. And so what are, what are cosmogenic isotopes? Well, uh, these are extremely rare isotopes, such as uh, the ones given here in the example. And these are produced by the interaction of high energy cosmic particles with minerals at the surface of the Earth. So we have uh, production of cosmogenic nuclides in the atmosphere. Um, um, these nuclides we call meteoric cosmogenic nuclides. One example that probably everybody knows is radiocarbon, used in radiocarbon dating. Uh, but we also produce them at the surface inside rocks. And actually, we also produce uh, carbon-14 in rocks. And this is something that many people are confused about. But anyway, there are two things that we have to remember two important aspects of cosmogenic nuclide analysis that are applicable to the presentation that I'm giving here. One of them is that concentration is proportional to time of exposure. Uh, so when we're looking at erosion rates, uh, fast erosion essentially means less nuclides, slow erosion means more nuclides. Uh, the other uh, important aspect is that if we have two nuclides, uh, one radionuclide and one stable or two radionuclides, the ratio of the two nuclides will change as a proportion of the time of burial. So if I have uh, a, a parcel of sediment that gets exposed and then buried, uh, during burial, nuclear production stops, uh, radioactive decay starts kicking in, and then we have a decrease of the ratio of the nuclides. And so we can exploit these things uh, to quantify rates of erosion or to quantify uh, the extent of or the, the duration of burial. Okay, so, uh, this is again a sort of an intro slide, so we know that landscapes are, are very dynamic, and that's something that uh, the very first talk has demonstrated very beautifully. Landscapes respond to forcings, um, you know, such as earthquakes, and that those forcings result in environmental signals. So let's say that uh, one of these is uh, an increased sediment flux, and those signals are then transmitted from source to sink. Um, What's interesting is that this sort of, the, the way that which signals are transmitted from source to sink changes depending on the environment, changing uh, as a function of the size of the basin we're looking at, uh, tectonic setting, climatic setting, and so on. So we have unique histories of sediment transport, deposition, and reworking, and these uh, will, reflect, will reflect changes in, in cosmogenic nuclide inventories both in the fluvial network but also in the deposition sink. So for example, if we have a parcel of sediment um, traveling across the network, um, the, there will be changes in the nuclide abundance, the cosmogenic nuclide abundance, and that change will be different for different isotopes depending to a very large extent on the uh, half-life of that isotope, but also on the production rate. And although beryllium-10 is sort of the, the workhorse of, of, uh, of the technique, so this is the, the, mostly, the, the, the most applied uh, isotope out there, there are others as well that, that we can, um, you know, we can analyze in a parcel of sediment. There are some that uh, are done routinely. There are others that um, are theoretically possible. Uh, and so we have a whole range of different isotopes, different half-life, different production rates, and therefore potentially we can, we can get a lot of detail about these processes. And so that this is what uh, my research is all about. This is what drives my research is, is trying to apply these isotopes to understand the source to sink system. Uh, our lab at, at Wollongong is, is about six years old. Um, we, we work um, all over the world, but you know there's a big concentration of work in Australia, as you can see on, on the map. So there's lots of samples that, that we collect in Australia, all kinds of samples, and there's a large inventory of sediment samples that we have collected. And again, this is not my own my work alone. There's a, there's a big group of people that are collaborating that we are working together. Uh, some of these people are listed on the slide here. But the idea is that we have this sort of uh, almost continental scale um, inventory of samples. We are slowly chipping away. The areas that you see on the map in, um, in red boxes, we have samples in hand. We didn't yet have time to process them. Uh, in some samples, we only have beryllium analyzed. In others, we have two isotopes. And in some, we have three isotopes, which is pretty uh, pretty unique. Uh, from a sort of global perspective. 
So I only have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, I can't talk about the entire continent. Uh, so I'll focus on, on two areas. I'll focus a little bit on the Murray Darling Basin and the work that we have done there. Um, and I'll focus on the East Coast um, and the work that we have done there. Okay, so uh, looking at the, the Murray Darling, one thing that obviously everybody in the audience knows is that rivers in Australia are different to rivers draining the Himalayas or the Andes because, you know, they do not start with a six kilometer or eight kilometer origin. I guess the best we can do in Australia is a roughly a thousand meters. Uh, we have a tectonically passive setting, which means that the, the rates will be low and that erosional signal, that environmental signal that is coming from the source is actually quite weak. Um, the other thing, uh, if we look at this map and if we believe what we see on this map, there's a lot of sediment um, blanketing the landscape. And if we look at a, a, a compilation of OSL and, and TL dates or, or ages of fluvial landforms, uh, some of the sediment is very old. And what's interesting for cosmogenic nuclides, which are sort of you know, sensitive at, at what happens in the upper two meters of the surface, you know, we can go um, anywhere in the, well, we can go in the Meridarling Basin or the LEB and, and, and at, at one to one between, between one and two meters depth, we can easily find uh, sediment, which is at least, you know, 10,000 years old. So there's a lot of old sediment lying around. The signal that's coming from the source is very weak. So there is potential here for um, diluting that, that signal, even sort of shredding that signal. And this is what we were trying to sort of quantify in the Merdaling Basin. Well, how much does it take for sediment to, to, to move from source to sink? And, and is, there, is there shredding of signal happening or is, there, is, is it complicated or is it sort of a simple scenario? So what we have done is we collected samples from uh, across the basin. Um, we tried to sample sort of the upstream reaches uh, of the various tributaries of the Darling and the Murray and also sort of the lower, the, the downstream reaches. Uh, this is a, it's, it's a huge basin, um, you know, and there's not many roads. Uh, and so the, our sampling strategy is a little bit sort of constrained or biased by accessibility. But I think we did a pretty good job, especially in the Darling. We have um, pretty much most of the tributaries captured and then we have the Darling um, all the way sort of downstream. And so what we do is we uh, collect these samples and we analyze, in the first case, we analyze beryllium and aluminum. These are two longer lived nuclides and that data is, is shown here. So just to explain this plot, uh, we have the aluminum 26 uh, beryllium 10 ratio on the y-axis, and then we have concentration on the x-axis. So what's happening here in a situation where sediment is, you know, brought to the surface and then there is a nice, simple exposure history. So sediment is exported uh, readily from the basin. Samples will be plotting on this dark uh, orange envelope here. So this is the simple exposure, simple erosion history envelope. If samples are plotting below that, then we're having a complex exposure. So there are different ways or different mechanisms to move the points under that envelope. Um, and they, they, um, the, the predominant one involves radioactive decay. So for that to happen, you need the sediment to be buried. Um, and if you look at the data, so if you look at the blue um, ellipses here, so these are a two sigma uncertainty. Uh, so these are samples from the sort of very upstream, the headwaters of the Murray and Marambiji. And they kind of, you know, we can't statistically distinguish between plotting on the simple exposure zone or the burial zone. But as we're moving downstream, there's a clear trend. And if we look at the data from the Darling, and pretty much all of them are plotting uh, in that complex burial zone. So what does it mean? Well, I mean, if we calculate, uh, so the, the furthest away they are, the, the longer the burial time should be. And if we calculate an apparent burial age, so the word apparent is very important here because there's a lot of assumptions involved in doing these calculations. Uh, but think of this as a minimum age. If we calculate an apparent burial age uh, for the lowermost darling sample, we get something around 1.2 million years. So that means that we had to have the equivalent of 1.2 million years of burial or co of cover 
or of time without production and time where decay could sort of kick in. Um, so the question is, well, okay, so what does this mean? Do we have somewhere a deposit which is that old and then sediment is being reworked from that deposit and incorporated into the channel and we basically have a binary mixture of fresh sediment and this very old sediment or is, is it a little bit more complicated? So what we can do to, to test that is to look at the sediment, which has a much, sorry, an isotope that has a much shorter half-life, that is more sensitive over those shorter timescales, and also something that would not survive uh, 1 million years of burial. So the half-life of aluminium is 700,000 years, the half-life of beryllium is 1.37 million, so we need something shorter. And fortunately, uh, you know, we have the capacity and capability in Australia uh, one of the few labs where we can analyze and extract, extract and analyze carbon-14 in rocks. Um, I don't have to tell you the half-life of carbon-14, but it's much shorter than 700,000, 1.37 million. So uh, what we do, we analyzed uh, carbon-14 in some of the samples. And again, what you see here is a repeat of the plot uh, that I showed you previously, where we have aluminum, beryllium, and beryllium. Uh, in this case, I'm showing beryllium carbon ratio. Now, the order is not important. I could show carbon beryllium, in which case the whole plot would be flipped. But uh, the point here is, again, we have this dark envelope, which is our uh, simple exposure history envelope. And then we have the burial zone where the samples are plotting. Uh, TB, so four, minutes, four minutes, please. Oh, OK. Well, I, I guess I'll, I'm just going to present very darling then. Uh, so anyway, so if we take all the data together, uh, what we can see is that um, this is more complicated. It's not just a matter of a binary mixing between young and old. There is mixing happening all over the place. There's, it's a continuous process. And so this means that the whole, uh, there's potential for the signal to be completely mixed up. All the sediment arrive at the sink at the same time. Let's say it's sediment from Murray and Darling arrive at the same point at the same time. They have started their journey. They have likely started their journey at very different times. Okay, so there's that, that decoupling in terms of time uh, between the different systems. Okay, so very quickly, uh, this is the East Coast. This is a this is a massive data set. So if 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 people who have worked with cosmogenic isotopes will understand, this is a huge data set. I'm going all the way from the uh, all the way across the Great Dividing Range. Um, you know, we're missing some samples from some of the Cape York area, but we have those in hand. Um, but anyway, two things I want to show you here. There's much more in the publication, but two things. One of them is that if we uh, put that data into context, into a more global context, and we compare it with um, all the various uh, passive margins, um, and look at the various topographic and climatic metrics that we can calculate, there's something interesting emerging. So the, the important thing here is the black diamond. The black diamond represents the median value of the, the, the fastest 10% rates in the data set. Okay, so I'm taking the Australian data set. I have, I don't know, 100 something data points. I'm taking the, 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 the fastest 10%. And that's where that value is. I'm comparing that with the fastest 10% from the other areas. And as you can see, with the exception of Namibia and South Africa, where we have very good reasons why those rates are so low, hyperaridity and, and extremely strong rocks. There's similarity between, between these high rates, you know, somewhere between 40 and 50 millimeters per kilo year. And that's despite the fact that we have big differences between the, you know, uh, the, the steepness of the channels of the hill slopes or even the precipitation in those areas. So essentially this is coming back to, a, to, to this concept of there being a limit as to how fast weathering can happen. And pretty much these landscapes are at, at, at that limit. So that is essentially, no matter where you would look, there is a cap as to how, how fast these posterogenic landscapes will be denuding. And, uh, you know, the Australian basins, the East, East Coast basins are very nicely fitting into that sort of global picture. There's nothing, there's, uh, there's nothing too low, there's nothing too high, it's, it's, it's behaving very nicely as compared to the other data set. But something that's even more interesting is that if we look at the aluminium beryllium again, these basins are big, but they're not as big as the Mary Darling, and some of them actually are quite, quite small. So why do we see these, again, depressed ratios? Why do the samples plot? So, so, the, so the dashed line here is our reference. This is what the uh, that, that uh, steady state of Northern Ireland would be. 
And the circles you see in gray, these are the two sigma. Um, so with high confidence, we can say that the, the ratio is below that. Uh, so what's the what's the reason for that? And it, it's not very real what we think it is. It's the it's something to do with the flood variability in these uh, in this area in this part of the world. And we have a comparison with these metrics of flood variability. At this stage, is a very qualitative comparison, yeah, but it yeah. match in the patterns. And um, um, anyway, so what we're thinking sorry. is that sorry. Um, we have this, this, this link between the, the periodic stripping of the floodplains and the tapping into sort of sediment, which, which might be older, uh, coming from that and that having these depressed ratios. But anyway, the, the, the sort of take home message in all of this is that, okay, uh, you know, we have this understanding of, of, a, of a system where we have a, um, um, Sort of the erosion engine at the source that's where the signal is produced that's where the story is being created and then we have the uh, conveyor belt that that sort of transmits the story to the to the sink but the reality is in many of these um, systems such as the australian river systems um, that conveyor belt might actually be a shredder where the information is sort of uh, messed up and you know we might be totally we might get totally depressed by hearing about this, but actually uh, there's good news. And the good news is that we can use this to our advantage. We can learn a lot about processes happening in, in, the, in the system, in the source to sink system. And the time is, is, is right for doing that now because we have, well, first of all, we have this um, Cosmo data set available. We have uh, compilations of OSL, TL, even radiocarbon, ages from a, from a range of uh, sedimentary deposits. But also we have now the ability to analyze all these different nuclei um, to sort of uh, get, a, get an unprecedented uh, level of detail on, on, on this process happening in these big basins. And so I'll leave you with, with this slide. Um, so I'm just gonna share a few basically photos from um, the North Island of New Zealand um, after the sort of last few weeks of um, pretty intense rainstorm events. Um, and this, uh, so, you know, New Zealand's had a pretty rough time over the last year or so. We've had um, the La Nina conditions and um, the positive southern annular mode and it's, uh, it basically allowed more of these tropical cyclones to come out of um, the, the, the Pacific down to, towards the tropical Pacific down towards um, New Zealand and, and had a lot of um, landfalls, but also these sort of atmospheric rivers coming from um, uh, the tropics as well. And so the last um, year or so, we've had a number of um, quite impactful rainfall events. And then um, just in the last um, few weeks this summer, we were successively hit by um, cyclone hail. Um, then this tropical atmospheric river at the end of January, and then um, cyclone Gabriel in, in just the last um, couple of weeks. And um, and, and it's been um, particularly impactful to New Zealand, and we've it's um, sort of our, our uh, the, the sort of the most significant um, storm event um, since. Um, Bowler in 1988 in terms of the, the number of lives lost and um, certainly the, the damage done. Um, so it's very, it has been very impactful. Um, and what I'm going to show today is just a, a bunch of photographs. This is completely sort of raw and um, I, I don't really have any interpretation to go to this, but this, these photographs have come from a, a range of sources, but particularly um, had some shared by Justin Stout from University of Canterbury, who's uh, in the um, Waterway Centre, who's out in the field now, um, who was supposed to be giving a talk to talk about his science, but um, he's out doing great stuff, collecting some of the uh, critical flood data at the moment. And also um, as part of GNS Science and GeoNet, there's a landslide response um, unit and they've been activated um, for the last few weeks and mostly involved in aerial 
uh, and helicopter reconnaissance. Uh, so collecting photographs and um, trying to get sort of critical information to various stakeholders on things like landslide, dammed lakes, and um, incipient failures above houses, and, and so on, and a bit of general intelligence. So there's like tens of thousands of photographs or so that I'm trying to summarize into a, a few minutes, and I've just cherry picked a few uh, and, and not in any particular order. But so um, some of the sort of major impacts, uh, particularly for the, the early events in, in January, were sort of around the coastal slopes uh, and the highly sort of urbanized areas and um, things like this. Um, a lot of properties uh, damaged as a result of in many cases living too close to to the edge um, and um, some pretty pretty serious damage here that's house see the house in the center has actually been um, displaced off its foundations and um, pushed up onto a onto the vehicle that was in in the driveway there um, and there were a few um, sort of larger failures that blocked rivers. Um, this one, um, you can see the lake up behind it. This one was non-threatening because uh, there was no um, major infrastructure downstream, but there were a few landslide dams that um, were um, threatening uh, communities downstream. So there were evacuations uh, as a result of those. And there's a team right now going up to Gisborne to study um, to re-scan and model the potential outburst flood from another one up near Gisborne. Uh, a lot of damage to the, the, the sort of the linear infrastructure uh, roads. Uh, this one, a double whammy, um, a highway and a, and a railway taken out. And this is one example of where the sort of aerial reconnaissance was quite useful because the rail company did not know about this particular um, impact on their, on their network. Uh, and a uh, lot of damage to houses from um, debris inundation um, and quite a few um, close calls where houses, some houses were very close to um, being significantly impacted and fortunately weren't, others weren't so lucky. Um, and this here is one um, incredible um, strike of, 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 of good fortune, I suppose, and this, this house was not um, impacted, but you can see that the property certainly was. Um, some of the lands, as I said, were um, larger. Many of them, the larger ones, were reactivations of older landslides. That's what it appears anyway. Uh, and, and some of these are then causing some ongoing um, concerns where um, there are downstream uh, properties and, and other infrastructure. So they will be um, focus of, of future work in monitoring those. Um, just another example of, of a coastal reactivation of a fairly large um, landslide here. And um, the so most of what I just presented was, was the earlier January um, cyclone hail and then the um, atmospheric river in late January. But the cyclone Gabriel was um, far more widespread and also um, a much larger number of landslides triggered and, and much more severe flood, flood damage. Um, this is just an example of, a, again, a very close call for this um, poor truck driver who um, was very, very narrowly avoided um, being swept away here on this. And this is a part of a road that connects um, East Cape and, and Gisborne with um, Hawke's Bay. And um, the road is ex extremely uh, affected, like hundreds of meters or kilometers rather, I should say, um, that have um, debris inundation on them. So it, it, you know, it's a significant job getting these, to get these roads open again. And um, this is not an isolated incident. There, there are many roads that have been damaged. And one of the, probably from a sort of a geomorphic perspective, one of the sort of quite striking things about Cyclone Gabriel, especially where it came down the East Cape and um, Eastern North Island is the, um, the combination of um, the extreme rainfall events, the extreme rain, um, steep slopes, weak materials, and in this case, um, not much vegetation cover. And so, you know, tens of thousands of landslides across the landscape, which is um, 
sort of uh, similar to a uh, cyclone in 1988, which was a, um, a very large uh, event for this area. And again, you know, this area has been been hit with a similar sort of magnitude. Um, in some places, um, severe gullying as well as shallow landsliding, uh, and some hill slopes just almost the whole whole slopes are, have uh, have failed. Um, and even here, you've got a little bit of forestry, um, young young forestry, but you can still see um, quite a significant impact there. So the, the forest hasn't, you know, has was not mature enough to really have an impact. But even in places where there was fully uh, mature, well, you know, pine forests that were close to being ready to harvest, um, you know, still significant impacts in um, places where there are steep slopes, weak rock, and uh, in, in that intense rain. Uh, and even in, I don't have photos of it, but they're, they're even in some of the um, completely native um, forest cover, uh, there, there were also um, landslides and, and particularly some, some large landslides. So um, that natural forest cover doesn't make the landscape immune by any means, but it, um, it certainly does help. And one of the big issues has been the impact of um, forestry slash or and, and log debris and um, sort of the downstream impacts of that. So just a couple of photos here of um, a log jam and another one here. This is a, a debris flow that's come out of uh, cut forestry cutover, but the dam is also made up of quite a lot of logs. So there's sort of a bit of a, a double whammy there, sediment and logs creating these, these lakes. And now, um, so I talked a bit about the, the, the landslides, but the, the flooding, um, was very severe and you know a lot of that flooding problem has is the sediment that's come from a lot of these landslides um, but just you know I, I'm not a flu building forest by any means so I can't talk too much of this but um, this is so just more of a, a slideshow of of some of the pretty severe damage but you can see in a few of these photos the sort of the depths of inundation of sediment um, which is, is pretty um, Pretty severe. There's down in the lower right there. You can see a, a building there with sediment up to its um, up to its roof, uh, and flooding was um, responsible for a lot of the sort of that linear infrastructure. Um, roads destroyed. Um, many many bridges around the regions um, have been destroyed or, or damaged. Uh, here's an uh, example of um, where rivers tried to go back to its uh, former course, I suspect, and um, sort of a pretty urgent uh, attempt to um, plug the hole there, that um, those earthworks. Uh, another example there of a, um, a bridge that's been destroyed and, um, and a, a, another um, impact has been to, to, to the agricultural, horticultural sector uh, and um, certainly in New Zealand we're we're already feeling the pinch or the, the, the pressure of that on our um, at the supermarket and I suspect we'll continue to do so um, over the next years or so because in some places it's not just we lost you know this year's supply or this year's supply of fruit the trees in some places are gone so they have been completely swept away so it, it's a significant event and um, and I, and I suspect um, there'll be a lot of lessons from it. Um, there's a lot of talk in the in the media certainly about um, having to build back better and um, get people out of the floodplains, uh, which is great to hear that conversation. Um, yeah, so that's just pretty much all I've all I've got on that. But yeah, just uh, a few pictures to share that over the next few months. There'll be uh, a, a lot of uh, more get data gathering and hopefully a bit of a, a bit of a science story that that will come from this to help help inform um, those decisions on on what to do um, next. Um, so my name is Sabrina Sears. I am a PhD student at Monash University School of Earth, Atmosphere, and Environment. Um, my research has focused on the mangroves in Western Port Bay in, um, in Victoria. And I've also been using some drones to capture some data as well. 
But um, for this research, which has been published um, in a paper, the data I'm going to talk about is not from drones, although I use some drone imagery to just make it a bit more you know, spicy. So um, today we'll be talking about some sedimentation patterns in two stands of Abyssinia Marina in Western Port Bay, Australia. Um, and I should also say that this research was sponsored by DELP, so the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning in Victoria, as well as the um, Monash Scholarship. Right. Has my slide moved? Oh my god. It might be the same problem you had before. So we're in your multiple okay. screens. That's it. It's going. Okay. So um I apologize in advance. My computer has decided to take time off after I've submitted. So it's a it's very slow. So I apologize for that in advance. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, mangroves and in Victoria and New Zealand we only have one species of mangrove and that's the Avicenia marina um, variety or Shalassica. Um and it, Avicenia marina is the most widely distributed species and has adapted to many environmental conditions. So in this figure we can see some of the um, adaptations that, ha that it has developed over time. So that includes hematophores, cable roots, aerial roots, and salt glands. And that allows it to essentially be able to thrive in that coastal environment. Um, the species that we have in Victoria and New Zealand has even more um, modifications or structural changes because it had to adapt to um, the cold hair. And that means that it they grow a bit shorter and they're multi-stemmed. Um, so the way that they affect the environment would be very different from that of um, tropical species, which is why I decided to um, study this. So this is the um, distribution of Abyssinia marina in Australia, and we're just going to be focusing on Western Port Bay, which is this little um, green dot there. Um, okay, so with... Um, Biogeomorphology, as you guys know, it's how um, ecosystems or biological entities actually affect the morphology of the, the landscape that they are part of. So for mangroves, we have these like very complex features which are developed to enable them to you know, exist in this area. And because of that and their location, they interact with um, incoming wave energy and that induces some um, complexities and intricacies in terms of how water now moves over the land because now you have drag forces in addition to like um, bottom drag. So, so we have these features such as roots, etc., which interact with the incoming wave energy. And because of this interaction, if there is some um, sediment supply, either from offshore or within the system, it actually affects the movement and the settling of um, the sediment. And over time, the sediments will kind of compact and affect the actual landscape of the area. So what this project is looking at is trying to um, discern the sedimentation rates of sedimentation patterns within stands of Avicenia Marina in um, Victoria. So Western Port Bay is an embayment located about 80 kilometers south of um, Melbourne, so the Melbourne CBD. Net circulation is controlled by um, the presence of French Island and Phillip Island. So we have water coming in from the Bass Strait through the northern arm and it goes around and there's a tidal divide at the um, north here. And then we have this like kind of exit. So even though there are different like water, water movements around the bay, this is the general circulation. And so we're only going to be looking at two sites, one's called Stony Point and the other is Hastings. Um, because of this, like the hydrodynamics of the bay, and the movements of sediments within the bay, it has enabled um, 
different structure to occur at the different sites in terms of like vegetation structure. Uh, yeah, so in terms of vegetation structure. So some of that was captured in this study as well. So to have a look at um, sedimentation rates, I used erosion pins. Um, and we chose to do that because it enabled us to have like a wide grid um, and to capture that dynamic movement of sediment over about a year and a half. Um, we strive to measure every three months. However, because of COVID and the limitations that it placed on, um, on field work, we actually missed some of those measurements. So we weren't able to capture like seasonal changes and, and stuff like that with sediment, but it did give us some indication of what factors actually affect sediment. And when we talk about sediment movements within these areas, we think of, um, and the factors that affect them, we think of elevation. So elevation of the land, the distance from the water source or the source of the sediment, the vegetation type, density, total suspended sediment, and significant leaf height. So we did look at all of these factors. However, today I'm only going to focus on vegetation, um, significant wave height, and total suspended sediment. Um, and this is an erosion pane that was covered in barnacles. So you can see that it's very difficult to actually um, sometimes measure them within the field because they do look like pneumatophores. So sometimes it takes like five minutes to find the pin in the field. Um, so this is the first site, it's called Stony Point. Stony Point has a sandier substrate than the other sites because of its location at the um, entrance to the Bass Strait. Um, it also has a more heterogeneous um, topography compared to the other site. So for example, this area here is a bit higher. It doesn't have a lot of vegetation, but it allows for water to move a lot faster through, the, um, through that area as opposed to this site, which is actually a lot denser. And to capture any data there, you literally have to crawl under the trees. Um, so vegetation density at Stony Point is very variable compared to that of Hastings, where you see like, like a more homogenous kind of structure. Um, so at Stony Point, we had 100 data points. And at um, Hastings, we had 80 data points um, that we measured periodically. So first, I'm going to talk about some of the differences in vegetation. So um, this is at the fringe of the forest in Stony Point. Like I said, we have a Sanya substrate. We also have a difference at the two sites where there is not a lot of vegetation at that fringe for Stony Point. So it goes, it doesn't kind of follow the typical zonation that, that we expect, where you have like some chance of pneumatophores passing and then you get into vegetation. It kind of just is very variable in that area. Um, and within the site at Stony Point, the trees are multi-stem, they're shorter than those at Hastings, and the pneumatic foot density is a lot lower as well. So we expected to see some um, like effects of vegetation on sedimentation rates, and um, we'll see if we actually saw that later. Um, and this is a 3D model of um, Stony Point, so kind of just giving an insight into what the vegetation kind of looks like. We have patches that you know, aren't very dense and then you go into very dense network of trees and you also have this like lower, shorter trees that kind of get in the way of water a bit more than they do at Hastings. So this is um, Hastings, muddier substrates. Um, the pneumatophores here are thicker than that of um, Stony Point. So average pneumatic foot density at Hastings was, sorry, average height at Hastings was 10.6 centimeters, while at Stony Point it was about eight centimeters. They were a lot thicker at Hastings as well. So diameter here was about 1.08 and higher density at 184.9 um, Pneumatophores per meter square at Hastings. Um, and also the vegetation at Hastings is a bit 
taller, so it's a lot easier to conduct these surveys, and there's a lot less, quote unquote, that's in the way of the incoming waves. So it would be in, it we thought it would be interesting to see how these two structures or the structures that these two set actually affect um, sedimentation. And again, this is a, another fly through at Hastings. I mean, you can hopefully you can kind of see that the vegetation is a bit taller. You get a lot more detail of like the actual stems at Hastings because the vegetation is so much taller than it is at Stony Point. Um, so in terms of, you know, again, what's in the way of the waves and the sediment, there is a lot less at uh, Hastings. Um, how does this look um, in a different way? So in a 2D kind of format, we did a um, profile of a transect at Stony Point on the left and Hastings on the right. Hastings has a much higher slope than Stony Point um, and taller trees. So we can see that in the heights we have there. So average height at um, Hastings would be about three meters, whereas at Stony Point it's about two to 2.5 meters. And we have some very short vegetation there as well. And in terms of just like a side profile of the vegetation at Hastings, um, you can see that, hopefully, that is not just me, that you can see that these trees are taller um, with a lot less in the way, whereas those at Stony Point are shorter, multi-stemmed, and they're, they're a lot bushier. Um, okay. So how does this translate to affecting sedimentation? So over the um, one and a half years of study, um, Hastings actually accreted more overall than Stony Point. Um, even though at Hastings, we had a period where we actually um, lost sediment. So in blue, we have our first measurement, but then we see that um, our second measurement, our third measurement, sorry, was less than that first measurement, meaning that overall we like there was erosion at that site. Um, but then Hastings came back with a bang at the end and ended up with a much larger um, overall accretion over that period. Whereas with Sony points, we get a lot less sediment at that site, um, even though it was continuously accreting, accretion didn't get to the level as such as Hastings. Mm -hmm. So in looking at um, some of the other factors that affect sedimentation, which have been said to affect sedimentation, we looked at the particulate matter from satellites. And even though, um, like Hastings and Stony Point, there isn't much difference between the. Oh, sorry. Sorry, that's my cat. Um, isn't that even though there's not much difference between the um, sediment overall, like suspended particulate matter between the two, you can still see some differences. So Stony Point definitely gets a lot less um, sediment than Hastings. Uh, a few minutes, outside. please, Sabrina. A couple of minutes. Um, however, um, we didn't find a correlation between um, sus suspended sediment matter and sedimentation rates. Um, and it, the reverse happened at, with waves. So Stony Point receives a lot higher or a lot more um, wave energy than Hastings, just because of the morphology of that coastline. Hastings is located behind an island, so there's a lot less wave energy coming in. So that would, yes, the, it makes quieter conditions for um, sedimentation. And the next thing that I'll show you is just a relation between the percentage of bare sediment and daily change. So when you looked at bare sediment, it was essentially how much of that one meter doesn't have any vegetation and how that affects um, sedimentation. Like, is vegetation actually affecting sediment that we can see with the data that we have. And it turns out uh, we can't deduct like a actual pattern here because we have points that have a lot of sedimentation, 
which don't have vegetation, but we have points that don't have a lot of sedimentation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. Sorry. Oh. oh my god. I think my computer's done. Um, okay. And finally, I can just show some of the variation that we see in sedimentation patterns. So we're trying to find a like, pattern of sedimentation at the site. There is none at Stony Point. We have both accretion and um, erosion occurring at the front and in the middle. Whereas at Hastings, we kind of um, see more of a patterning, but we have erosion at the front and accretion in the middle, which means that there would be some movement from the front to the back at that site. And uh, in terms of covariance, um, there is a lot of variance between the sites. So there's not one pin that like kept creating or kept um, eroding. It's very dynamic within that area. So in conclusion, um, we couldn't find a link or wave height and total of um, suspended matter were insignificant in determining short-term sediment distribution and vegetation as well as the other factors we looked at didn't occur for the longer term spatial variability that we saw. Thank you. Um, thanks for hanging out for the last um, talk of the session. Um, sometimes it's hard going last, but I was thinking it's great to be last today because Katie has done an awesome overview of my study area for me and Tibby did a great overview of cosmogenic radionuclides for me, so I don't have to do quite as much work tonight, <laughs> which is great. Um, so we'll kick into it. Um, my presentation today is called Multidisciplinary Approaches to Landscape Geomorphology. So just going to start with a bit of background for the New Zealand context. And in 1840, the British Crown, along with the Māori chiefs of New Zealand, signed the Treaty of Waitangi, which is essentially the founding document of the modern nation of New Zealand. There were three main articles of the treaty, which were participation, protection, and partnership. And now we don't have time to get into the complex history of the treaty. And though I want to acknowledge that complex history, the main reason for bringing this up today um, is because the treaty and its principles are the fundamental grounding for many movements today to revitalize, enable, and empower Maori-led research and innovation in New Zealand. So, the biggest, one of the biggest legislation movements towards accomplishing this goal is Vision Matauranga, which is a government policy intended for unlocking the innovation potential of Māori knowledge, resources, and people. Essentially, all research, no matter the field, has to show that it has considered the applicability to Māori communities, and if it's applicable to them, has sought to include Māori as partners in the research. Whoops, sorry. Um, there's also Te Mana o Te Wai, um, which is New Zealand's 2020 legislation for freshwater management and explicitly addresses Māori values for freshwater management. So Te Mana o Te Wai and the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management require that city or regional councils give effect to those Māori values for freshwater in freshwater management plans. And so Te Mana Otiwai is particularly relevant to fluvial geomorphology um, and is also a large component of much of the work that I do in my current role as a consultant. So how is all of this relevant to my PhD research? When I came to New Zealand, it was to study the fluvial response to the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake, which was one of the most complex earthquakes ever recorded at the time, with over 170 kilometers of surface fault rupture along numerous faults, and resulted in triggering about 30,000 landslides, as Katie told us earlier. Um, and you can see some of the significant changes to the landscape in those photos there. 
My study area um, was the Conway River, um, which experienced over two and a half thousand landslides with a total source area of about two square kilometers. So that source area equates to about 2.3% of the subcatchment area in the headwaters in the seaward Kaikaldas, which sounds like a small number, but kind of compared to global data sets of large magnitude earthquakes and their corresponding co-seismic landslide inventories, it's actually a pretty high percentage, so it makes it a really cool um, study catchment. So when I first started my research, I was interested in the following questions. At what rate is the landslide material moving through the Conway catchment? What are the catchment averaged apparent erosion rates in the recently disturbed Kaikoura ranges? And how long will it take for this landscape to heal? And it was with that last question that I started wondering, well, what does it mean for a landscape to heal from both a scientific and a human perspective? And how are major perturbations such as earthquakes perceived to change a landscape? And should people be involved in helping a landscape to recover? And so these questions made me realize that if I really wanted to understand this landscape, I needed to consider other perspectives and ways of looking at landscapes. So now we'll just take a minute to think about the different perspectives or lenses through which we can look at landscapes. We can look at landscapes through a geologic or geomorphic lens and use concepts such as dynamic equilibrium, uplift and erosion, landscape evolution models, climate feedbacks, biogeochemical systems and feedbacks, or hazards to understand landscapes. We can also look at landscapes through a more social science lens, looking at land use, ecosystem services, risk and disasters, and resource sustainability, essentially how people engage with landscapes. And the third lens we'll consider today is indigenous and traditional knowledge. So through this lens um, and the language, place names, culture, art, stories, and oral histories of indigenous and traditional knowledge, we can gain a broader perspective of landscape change and how different communities have lived with and understood those landscapes over a longer period of time. So using all of these lenses, we'll have more tools in our geomorphic toolkit to understand landscapes and our relationships with them. So that's a bit of the why, um, but not so much of the how. So when I started to get into how I was going to do this research, I started researching frameworks for conducting bicultural research and landed on the Hay Awafidia Braided Rivers approach to bicultural research. The Hay Awafidia approach uses the metaphor of a braided river to show how different streams of knowledge can interact. In this approach, there can be multiple research threads, each grounded in their respective knowledge epistemology that inform, focus, and influence the other throughout the research program. And at the conclusion of the research, all streams contribute to the outcomes and conclusions. So this is the approach that I adopted from my research. And with Māori supervisors and community-based participants, we developed a series of questions relevant to the Kaikoura area, as well as other areas around New Zealand that have experienced significant landscape altering events in the past. So I had three streams to my research river. Um, the first was geochemical tracing of landslide material using cosmogenic radionuclides. The second was cobble tracers. And the third was semi-structured interviews with mana whenua, or the local indigenous people. And all three of those research streams contributed to the research outcomes. So I'll go through each of these streams. So um, the first research stream was the geochemical tracing of landslide material. Um, and I used cosmogenic radionuclides to try and trace that landslide material as it was working its way through the Conway River system. And essentially, this part of the research revealed 
there are numerous styles of landsliding in the catchment um, and the landslide material is being stored, mobilized and remobilized in different ways that correspond to a large range of potential export times for this landslide material. The bed load tracers also revealed a range of times for potential sediment transport through the study reach. And we calculated a variety of bed load flux rates for different grain sizes, which correspond to a large range of potential export times for the landslide material. So the main takeaway from this part of the research um, was that it is possible for some of the grain size fractions um, to be mobilized before the next big earthquake, um, but we'll need more research to um, kind of refine some of those numbers. Finally, the third part of my research um, was the conversations I had with individuals from different iwi or Maori tribes around Aotearoa, New Zealand. And we talked about their experiences and perspectives of large landscape altering events. We had conversations about the physical appearance of landscapes, as well as cultural values of connections, sustainability, reciprocity, adaptability, and time and natural healing that can be applied to help communities adapt to landscape altering events. All of these values are to do with building and maintaining relationships with people between communities and with the land itself. And so together with um, the Maori members of my research team, uh, we started to think of how the results from each of these three streams could complement each other. And so in applying the Hei Awafiria approach to research, we developed our research river. So our research river involved the methodologies of Mataranga Maori, geomorphology and some chemistry and physics. Um, we looked at iwi environmental management plans and I conducted the semi-structured interviews, as well as looking at the geochemical tracing of the landslide material and the bed load tracers, which led us to an analysis that incorporated values, concerns, priorities, and partnerships of, um, of the different people I worked with, intergenerational knowledge and observations of landscape change, catchment-wide apparent erosion rates, landslide evacuation times, processes of land of time scales and landscape change. And the thing that really brought all of these different parts of the research together was thinking about time scales of landscape change and response. And so of course, thinking about human engagement as well as geologic and geomorphic landscape change and response. And the conclusions of the research were a bicultural narrative of the Conway River's earthquake story and a bicultural geomorphic concept, which is what um, I'm going to focus on for the rest of the presentation. So the bicultural geomorphic concept builds upon um, pre-existing ideas of landscape evolution. Here we have kind of a unidirectional approach or way of thinking of landscape evolution. And that builds on, um, or sorry, grows to a bi-directional view of landscapes and how physical humans and bi biota, biota all in, interact with each other um, as elements of the landscape. And our multi-directional um, concept for landscape evolution looks like this, and we called it landscape co-becoming. So landscape co-becoming, we've defined as the process of a landscape evolving as a product of all that have, do, and will inhabit it, including human, non-human, and physical entities, processes, and values. It can incorporate biota, oceans, land, climate, tectonics, people, stories, and memories. And it can be imbued with those cultural values of connections, adaptability, sustainability, and reciprocity. And so I'd just like you to take a moment to think about those lenses through which we can think about our landscapes and we're going to apply them here. Cultural and human geography lens can, can span memories, stories, and people. Uh, three and minutes, please, please. Thanks. Thank you. And the physical science lens, geomorphology, geology, biology, ecology, physics, and chemistry can cover the other items. 
but it's really the indigenous knowledge and worldview lens that can tie all of these elements together. And so it sounds kind of complicated, but there is a growing recognition um, that for an in order for our understanding of landscapes and for practical and sustainable interaction with them to be successful, we have to move towards these more complex and holistic investigations of them. And some people are already doing this. In Australia, for example, this research group has acknowledged the agency of the land where their research was carried out, acknowledged that the research would not be possible without the land itself, and therefore acknowledged the land as a key contributor to the research. Another group um, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, explored perspectives on what it means for a river with legal personhood to have rights and what ge role geomorphology might play in helping to acknowledge and honor those rights. And so, um, in my experience in both the research and consulting space, what all this is about, what I'm trying to convey here, is that um, non-Indigenous researchers like myself um, have to be appropriately ready to respond and be allies in this space. Um, something that I've learned is that working with Māori um, needs to be driven by those groups or kind of in colloquial terms, like they get to call the shots and decide what's important um, to them and what capacity they have to contribute and what outcomes they want to achieve. And I think for geomorphology, this is a really relevant topic because our understanding of landscapes needs to involve all the ways of understanding and um, thinking about landscapes, not just one way in isolation. And so to end, um, I'd just like to share this quote from some researchers in Canada, which I think sums up the message of this presentation quite eloquently. They say, we are now more aware than ever that every landscape is a complex concept with a complex history that requires both global and local frameworks of inquiry. We need to revisit how we understand landscapes from more than one perspective in time and space. And with that, I will say thank you, especially to my supervisors, the many different people at many different places that supported me, um, and to the wonderful people that I got to work with from the community as well. So, and thank you for listening. So we're going to have to leave it there. I would just like to thank our speakers today, Katie, Liz, Tibby, Sam, Sabrina and Claire, we've covered from um, Sabrina with um, process geomorphology through to um, long-term processes, uh, offshore processes. It's been a smorgasbord of fantastic geomorphology today, right through to social and cultural issues. I really would like to thank uh, your um, the speakers for taking the time. And I'd like to thank you all for taking the time over dinner for, for coming along to this session. I'd like to wish you all a happy uh, International Geomorphology Day. Finally, I'd like to thank um, my co-organizer, Nicole Wheeler, uh, for her assistance. I'd like to thank Sam again for pulling together all that material. And I'd like to thank Susan Conway from the IAG who uh, initiated this, this whole uh, format. Uh, thanks again, everybody. The, um, we've recorded this session and it will be um, available. Can I recommend you to go to the ANZGG uh, LinkedIn site? or their website where the, uh, the, the recording from today will be available, or you can just email me as well, but that should be available in, in a, a day or two. Thanks again for your pre uh, attendance and happy geomorphology week. Go out and see some. Thanks everybody. <laughs>